So our next speaker is Francis Percival. He is the food editor and columnist for uh, World of Fine Wine. He has a book coming out soon. He's a co-founder of the London uh, Gastronomic... London Gastronomy London Seminars. Uh, teaches about cheese and wine at Neil's Yard Dairy. Uh, I'm really excited about this next talk. Uh, I think you're all going to really enjoy it. Without further ado, Mr. Francis Percival, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Great. It was when I was invited here by uh, Stephen to come and talk about what the cheese industry can teach the world of coffee, I thought, quite frankly, that Stephen was mad. Uh, when I see events like this, conferences like this, how, how vital, how energetic, and how dynamic the coffee community is, this is actually something that the world of cheese is desperately trying to learn from you about. This is something that uh, there, are, there are the beginnings of the growth of a cheese community, in, certainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, but uh, you've got there first, and so, so I, I, was, I was a little bit curious about what, what I could actually talk to you about. So, but then I realized, actually, people operating in the, what we might broadly think of as the specialty cheese sector, certainly the farmhouse cheese sector, those cheeses made by the people who are milking the animals themselves. In the Anglo-Saxon world especially, they are operating in exactly the same niche relative to their consumers as you guys are as baristas. And so first I think it's, it's useful for us to consider exactly where I'm coming from. A lot of these examples are going to be taken from the UK, where I live. But uh, the British cheese industry, many of you might be familiar with cheeses like cheddar or uh, Cheshire or Stilton or things like that. But by the 19, early 1980s, the British farmhouse cheese industry was pretty much dead. Producers had almost universally moved over to selling liquid milk rather than processing the milk on their own farms. And production was no longer uh, centered around the established, uh, for want of a better word, traditional cheeses, but had moved towards vac packing in plastic and creating cheeses that would be shelf stable and comfortable for sale on a supermarket shelf. Now these, uh, figures, I think, say everything. So this is um, 1939 against 2015. And we see, in 1939, and I have to say, even in 1939, this is after a period of considerable decline. In Cheddar, so in, in, in Somerset, in the west country of England, the home of Cheddar, uh, there were over 300 farmhouse producers of raw milk cheese. It's, I think it's worth emphasizing raw milk. If you're interested in producing a, a cheese that has a sense of its own uniqueness, a sense of place, then raw milk, I don't want to say that it's, it's sufficient, but it's absolutely necessary. Cheese is a fermented food. There's some talk before about diversity. I think personally that cheese gives you the best capacity to appreciate the biodiversity of a farm. It links, you, it allows you to taste an agricultural gestalt, if you want to, th want to think of it that way. It links biodiversity at the macro level in terms of what mammals are you milking, how, what animals have you got, at sort of the meso level of what are your pastures like? What's your system like for how do you feed these animals in the winter? How are you farming? What's your fertilizer use like? Uh, what's your stocking density? All of these sorts of questions you can taste in the finished cheese. And then at the microbial level as well. And I think that's where cheese becomes particularly interesting. It's a chance to taste your own, I know microbial terroir is a, is a, is a, a controversial concept, but it's a chance to taste what's going on at that microscopic level as well. And you see, this is, this is a period of absolute decline. So cheddar from over 300 cheeses or cheese makers to, to just three. And the really sad thing is with just three farmhouse cheddar producers in Somerset, nobody else will enter that market because they feel that it is globally saturated. So this is a story of complete decline. And from the production side, the biggest problem of this decline is it has destroyed the infrastructures that were in place for communicating and teaching expertise. 100 years ago, or in, in the late 19th century, 
the UK had a tremendous infrastructure to teach people to make cheese. We had brilliant cheese schools. We had consultants who would help you solve problems. And just the sheer sort of clustering effect, the sheer vitality that, co that comes from hundreds of producers all working in a close geographic area, making the same product, meant that you had uh, a, 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 a real sort of di dynamism in terms of even commissioning some scientific research uh, in the 1890s. Now that, unfortunately, in the UK at least, and certainly in the US as well, has been completely lost. Those of some of you from countries like France still have these infrastructures in place, and for that we are, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, very jealous. But I think it's not just on the production side that expertise has been lost. Consumers themselves have lost the art, have forgotten how to buy cheese. When your only encounters are the supermarket shelf, where you just sort of grab and go and then carry on, things like packaging, things like uh, discounts on the supermarket pricing become much more important than ha being able to have a discussion with the person who's selling you the cheese and to, to, to think about it, to discuss what, what your preference is. is. So this is, is a, I, I love this photo. This is uh, Burnley in the northwest of England, so sort of uh, near Manchester. Uh, and this is their old market hall from the, the 1960s. And this, this, I think, shows what we've forgotten. It's the, the consumer engaging with the specialist retailer who might be, just be a dedicated retailer, there might even be the, the producer, and talking about the cheese. So the, the, the cheese uh, that's local here is a cheese called Lancashire, named after the county where, uh, uh, where Burnley is. And we have, for those of you coming to the workshops, we, we, we're going to taste a couple of examples of Lancashire uh, this afternoon. But we, I, in London, putting on a tasting of, of, of just of Lancashire cheese, it was an utter commercial disaster. Nobody came. But what was interesting about the people, who, the handful of people who did come, is they were all born in the county of Lancashire. If you're operating in this system, you probably don't eat a lot of different types of cheese, but you are highly engaged with the cheese that you do eat. Lancashire comes in all sorts of, of different hues and styles and producers, and you'd have this really, really finely grained idea about what quality is and about what your preferences would be. And that is something that our consumers have forgotten. At the same time, cheese consumption has gone through the roof. So this is the US, and we can see that in the US, cheese consumption has more than tripled since 1970. So this, for me, is how the world of cheese, of, of, of I don't like artisan, but of, of specialty cheese is exactly like coffee. This is a product that punctuates people's lives every day, and you have to cons communicate to your consumers about why this dramatically more expensive product that you're selling to them is worth the extra money, why it's different from the cheese that they're eating, quite, quite frankly, heroic quantities of already. <laughs> now, there are two styles, I think, and, and we, we can debate, and I think this is interesting talking with, a, with a, a multinational audience, whether I'm being overly Manichaean in how I separate these things out. There are broadly two styles of selling cheese. The first is the French method. Now, the French method relies on accepting the role of the cheesemonger, the person who'll sell your, your cheese, who might be in themselves be an affineur, they might be someone who ages cheese themselves. Uh, and essentially, you are highly deferential to their expertise. You turn up at their shop and you say, hello, Mr. Cheesemonger. I am having X number of people for a meal at however many days in, in, in advance. Please give me the cheese that I need. And the cheesemonger, it's, it's a much more patrician model. The cheesemonger then deploys their wonderful expertise and decides on the right cheese for you. They engage, they engage with truth so you don't have to. Uh, this, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of, of this chap. This is uh, uh, someone called uh, Laurent Dubois. He has three shops in Paris, and I think he has a good claim to being the world's best cheese, uh, cheesemonger, cheesemonger affineur. 
Uh, they're brilliant shops. I highly, highly recommend them if you're, if you're visiting Paris. But I think the key thing to see is just around his neck. See the little tricolore uh, thing? That is the medal of the Meilleur Ouvrier de France, which is a national competition in France for artisanship. And it's not just for, for cheese or even not just for food industry things. They, there, there are butchers and charcutier, yes, and, and they make a big fuss of the patissier competition, but it's also for, for carpentry, for design, for all of these sorts of things. And it's something that every Frenchman, and, well, French woman, understands. Your taxi driver knows that the, uh, the cheesemonger is a meilleur ouvrier de France. They, they call them moffs. Uh, and I think this is, this is, just as an aside, this is something that Specialty Coffee could investigate. If you are in a country which has these national certifications of expertise, apart from the, the, sort of the international certifications that we see with the, the, the institutions of Specialty Coffee, those are a useful way to, to engage with consumers where you have this much more deferential model. Now, the second method is the Anglo-Saxon method. So... This is a shop called Niels Yarderi, as, as uh, Stephen mentioned. I, I do uh, cheese tastings, wine tastings for them. Uh, my wife is the cheese buyer for uh, this company. I actually, I actually live directly above the shop where, the, where this photo was taken. But I think this shows the retail style, how instead of the consumer being deferential to the expertise of the cheesemonger, you hope the cheesemonger is still highly expert, but it's more a, a, a shared journey, a, a joint exploration based around tasting the cheese together, and then they can find the right cheese for, for you as the consumer. And I think this is, this is the highly distinctive thing about this retail model. You see it a fair bit in the United States, and also you see it in Spain as well. So here, uh, this is a shop that uh, was started in Madrid, by Alvaro, who's a, a long-time ex Niels Yarderi employee. And you see how, in the Spanish context, deploying exactly the same retail model. I think I, I love this pose, this over the, the retail slate, offering the tasting of, uh, of the cheese. And this is, I think, highly uh, distinctive. This is the great advantage of cheese. Cheese is easy to taste out. If you're trying to pull shots of espresso in a high volume bar, this is obviously going to be a much, much more difficult shared experience to have. But the shared experience is vital. This is your chance, as I say, to educate without educating. There's been allusions to no one wants at seven in the morning to have a lecture about climate change. But this is your chance while having an in, hopefully an enjoyable experience with the consumer to talk a little bit about the experience of tasting, about what those tastes might mean. And that, I think, is really where the cheese industry can have some, some useful things to say for the world of coffee. Because this is the case. Your language of quality, those aspects that the language you'd use to describe the product, they themselves shape the product. So if you think that creaminess, for example, is a, something to be desired in cheese, then you devote your attention as the producer to try to make your cheese more creamy. And within the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world, certainly, and this is, this is where your chance to, to laugh at the sort of the, the uh, dull English, creamy is a huge problem as a descriptor, because with a naive consumer, you give them a sample of just about any cheese. And this could be anything, this could be, this could be Parmesan. You give them a sample of cheese, and they will say, mmm, that tastes creamy. And this is, this is, this is the poverty of our, of, our, of our English vocabulary more than anything else. We don't have lots of words for describing dairy experiences. And so, I, I have a dairy product in my mouth, mmm, that must be creamy. But we, we see we then have an industry, or we have the risk of an industry, that's geared up to meet these, uh, these, these demands. This is a, a, very, a very good cheese called Harbison, made in Vermont in the United States. Uh, but 
many of the new US cheeses are deliberately targeting this idea of, let's make something a bit gooey. Let's make something that, if they like creamy, let's make it a little bit more creamy. Let's perhaps add extra cream to the milk to e exaggerate that creaminess of effect. And you see, even, even in British territorial cheeses, we'll have a chance to taste two Stilton-style cheeses this afternoon. And with those, the history of Stilton in the last 50 years has been the progression towards ever greater creaminess. So there is this, this great point of, of convergence around the vocabulary. And that, I think, is important because the classic thing you will have, and I am sure I, it, it's, it's very interesting when we see here the, the, the coffees being served here all have a, a very brief description of a flavor profile. But I'm sure you regularly have with consumers, you give them a sample, you give them a coffee, and the consumer's immediate reaction is, what am I tasting? Tell me what I'm experiencing. Tell me what I need to think. And I, I think broadly, and again, I'm probably over-systematizing, but broadly, there are four different approaches that we can use to address this question. The, the different ways of, of engaging, different, different languages, different vocabularies to, to talk about the idea of tasting. So the first, and the one which I think has the, certainly the, the scientific rigor of, of being thoroughly a part of the world of sensory science, is the idea of aromatic descriptors. Now, this is the flavor wheel for Comte cheese from the east of France. As you can see, it's, it is nowhere near as good or as sophisticated as the new SCAA wheel, which I think is a, is a really remarkable piece, both of art and of, of sort of uh, utility for describing cheese. But this has all of those classic uh, aromatic descriptors that you might see. It has vegetal, it has animal, it has spicy, it has lactic. And each of those ideas, you can ha find a defined taste exemplar, you can train up a sensory panel, and you can do some proper, proper statistics. If we want to find out real information in controlled scientific experiments, this is a vital approach. This is very, very useful. However, to what extent is it useful in engaging with your consumers? And I think here it's, it's, it's useful to think about how recent this aromatically driven approach is in, in the history of talking about how things taste. It's one of the great, write, writing a book which is essentially about the history and science of cheese, one of the great frustrations is until Probably the latter part of the 20th century, most Anglophone commentators on cheese would describe cheese flavor as good or as bad. And so if you're trying to recreate what a, what a 19th century cheddar might have tasted like, all you know is sometimes it tasted good and sometimes it tasted bad. And we, we, we see this in all, all sorts of other different industries. This approach is very much a product of the 1970s of uh, trying to investigate the wine industry, of, 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 of Anne Noble out of UC Davis. Uh, and you see, even be before then, I don't know if we've got any francophones in the audience, the French would classically describe wines in heavily gendered language. You might have a, a virile masculine wine, or you might have a, 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 a delicate, sensual feminine wine. Uh, the English, as is our want, would describe wines in terms of class characteristics. So we would have, I like this wine, it's classy, this is a classy wine. This is a wine of breeding. <laughs> or I might, I might not enjoy this wine because it is, it's rustic, it's uncouth. Again, bringing these ideas of, of, of class judgments. We can, we can argue about why that was, but, but I think it's, it's interesting and useful to think that people have been describing flavors for a long time, and it's only very recently that aromatic descriptors became a part of it. Now we can have statements of cultural values, and this is where we, we, we raise the, uh, the awkward concept of tradition. Now, the problem with ideas, so this is the symbol of the European Union protected designation of origin, this is uh, the idea behind uh, most senses of appellation, it's also the idea behind things like the slow food presidia and the arc of taste. Uh, they're useful. They're really, really useful. If you're talking to disengaged consumers and you want a very quick and dirty way to say, this is a high quality product, it wraps up to together all of the sort of very useful ideas of, uh, of, of quality in one nice little government stamp. The problem becomes almost universally 
these statements cannot withstand serious academic scrutiny. You see how PDOs are political constructions which owe more to the local politics of the Appalachian, or with things like, the, so going back to our Somerset cheddar producers, things like the slow food uh, presidia for, for artisan Somerset cheddar, they defined themselves so heavily in opposition to shrink-wrapped uh, supermarket cheddar that's aged in plastic that they said, right, the key element of our cheddar is that it is wrapped in cloth as it ages. And this is, this is a distinctive thing. It's, it's almost universal as a characteristic of these British territorial cheeses. It's something that we do and, and not much of the rest of the world does. However, when you investigate this traditional practice, you realize it actually originates from the American cheese factories of the mid-19th century. It's essentially a way to protect your cheese in a pre-refrigeration era from the vagaries of the New England summer. And yet it has become the defining feature of traditional British cheese in opposition to industrial cheese. So cultural values, tradition, they are useful, but I think they are distinctly problematic if you care about, about it being essentially true. We can have quantitative statements. We can put a number on it. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not entirely sure to what extent this has happened in, in the coffee industry. It's certainly something that the spirits industry has done a lot and has very effectively taught people the bigger the number, the better. And we see very similar things in uh, the world of cheese um, where to make a cheese good, clearly you need to age it for as long as possible. And to my mind, this is in itself problematic. We look back to the late 19th century, and let's, using the example of cheddar, those cheddars would have been aged probably for something between three and nine months a year at tops. Now, because age is a number, and numbers are really easy to talk to the consumer about, a bigger number is clearly better, uh, they might be aged for two years. They might be aged for three years, by which time, I'm afraid, they taste rather like this mimolet. So mimolet, French cheese, the closest that cheese gets to a cannonball. And there was one historical incidence of this actually being fired out of a cannon when they, they ran out of cannonballs. And you can see, this is marketed as extra old. It's quite expensive. But to be honest, it, uh, as my wife says, it indulges a necrophiliac passion. <laughs> this is a cheese that has essentially died. And it tastes of old cheese. Uh, this, an, an old mimolette will taste of old cheese. An old cheddar will taste of an old cheese. An old palm Parmesan will taste of old cheese, and old Comte will taste of old cheese. You are tasting old cheese. And this is the problem of these quantitative statements. You, you, you introduce as, uh, the aesthetics of pornography, that if there's a number, well, let's just make it bigger, because that's clearly better. <laughs> now, our fourth method of talking about these flavors is one that I, I find very interesting. This is something I'm excited to present to a, a multilingual audience. So this is if I was to tell you that one of these shapes is called booba and the other shape is called kiki. Now, which one do you think is booba? The one on the right, absolutely. There, there is, and it's not, not something you even need to think about. It's absolutely clear. Now, this is, this is a phenomenon that was discovered in the late 20s, and it's... it's, it's very interesting from, a, uh, from the psychological point of view, it goes to the neurological underpinnings of language, and it, it's a very robust result. It, it's, you, you see it universally across humanity. It's as, as true for native speakers of Tamil as it is for American undergraduates. Uh, and this is, I think, promising because a lot of the classic methods that we use to describe in just sort of the vernacular to describe cheeses actually deploy these shape metaphors. So this is something that Niels Yarderi, in collaboration with uh, Professor Charles Spence and his lab at Oxford University, actively investigated within cheese, asking essentially, and th there, there is a paper out, out of it, I can give you, I can give you the reference, uh, asking consumers essentially to taste a series of cheeses and rate them on a kiki to booba scale. Now, uh, the interesting thing about the result was that uh, you essentially got statistical noise 
until they refined the question and asked consumers to, talk, to rate the smell and then separately rate the taste. And it was quite clearly that things like a, a ripe, cam an oozing sort of camembert-style cheese that uh, many people, if they, if they prioritize the smell, because, I mean, those things pong, uh, they rated it as kiki. And if they prioritized the texture, that sort of oozingness that you get, then they would rate it as booba. So separating those out uh, uh, gave, I think, a, a, a much, much greater clarity, and it made things much, much easier to find statistical significance. Uh, but this offers real, real promise for talking to naive, untrained consumers, people who haven't been, had lots of sniff tests and, and you haven't prop tested, you, have, you haven't made part of a consumer panel, because you can say of a cheese, for example, we might have a cheddar, and you can say of that cheddar, oh, it has, it's sharp, a shape metaphor. Uh, it's jagged, the flavor, again, a shape metaphor. We might have a very young, rindless goat's cheese, and we could say, oh, it's soft, it's mellow, it's delicate. Again, bringing in these ideas of shape metaphors. These are not things you want in a sensory panel because I can't find a... Uh, finding the taste exemplar for uh, jagged is really difficult. You can't do a simple sniff test on it. And, and to be honest, the results that you'd get would, would not necessarily be, be useful to you. But in that moment, that little brief span where you have the chance to talk with your customer while you're both eating the product, that can become very, very useful just to shape and contour their ideas. Now, the question becomes, which of these four approaches is the most useful. And it's something that we've thought about at a, a, in very great deal. Should, should we move all taste descriptors of cheese to the purely metaphorical? Or conversely, should we adopt, as the, uh, as the coffee industry has, should we adopt more aggressively uh, very carefully calibrated aromatic descriptors? But I think that actually the descriptors that matter is it's using all of them using those that are most appropriate to your audience because you want to use, in that brief interchange you have, the approach for talking about the product that resonates most deeply with your consumers. And this is interesting. This is some other slightly tangential research that we've done on relating it to cultural identities. How do people's attitudes towards raw milk cheese how are they shaped, not so much by the cheese, but by, by who they are, by how they define their cultural values? And here, so we've got up on the, the y-axis, we've got a very standard sort of political scale of, of uh, authoritarian at the top, as it probably should be, and then down to, to libertarian. Do you prioritize your individual freedoms, or is it the, sort of the, 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 the rules and structures, the top-down side of things? And then on the x-axis, we've got traditional on the left, moving to modernist. Essentially the question of, do you think that the world is better now than it was 100 years ago? And, and you see very quickly that different groups, and here we've just got four different groups from, from, from relating to the cheese industry, segment very, very easily into to quadrangles in this way. So we see that libertarian traditionalists are we see the classic raw milk advocates. These, I think, are best exemplified in the United States by people like the Freedom Riders, people who, in order to, as they say, defend from the government their right, libertarian, to engage in a traditional practice, traditionalists, uh, will take raw milk across state lines in violation of federal law. And then we see uh, the, sort of the authoritarian rules-based uh, traditionalists, the, the logic behind a lot of those sort of Appalachian rules. And then in the top right-hand corner, the, the really ruthlessly white heat of technology modernists who are also massively authoritarian and rules-based, as you would expect, we see the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the US public health regulator. And it becomes 
depending on where these people sit, how you talk about the product to them in exactly the same product would be dramatically different. So with, uh, if you have a representative from the FDA, you might want to talk about this is why this is so interesting scientifically, because again, that resonates. If you have a representative from uh, the Old Ways Cheese Coalition, the activist group that defends raw milk cheese in the United States, then you probably want to talk about this cheese is interesting because it's so traditional, because it reflects uh, traditional practice and uh, we want to celebrate our rights. And I think that with you coming from a, a diversity of backgrounds uh, of it internationally, this is where it becomes very interesting because what resonates with your audiences will be different depending on where you are, depending on the customers with whom you engage, the approaches you take will be dramatically different. And again, we, we've had talk about biodiversity, we've had talk about diversity in terms of coffee farms. This is the opportunity to have diversity in terms of a language of quality with your consumers. And as we've seen, once you shape that language of quality, define the target that you're trying to aim at, then you're defining diverse cheeses. Nothing would be more damaging to the world of cheese, and I would argue to the world of coffee, than having a single globalized language of quality that everyone just wants to make sort of magical unicorn cheese that will, uh, everybody will like. You want, the, the, it has its interest, from the perspective of the producer, it has its commercial sustainability from its capacity to be unique and unlike anything anyone else produces. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, there is no definition of specialty coffee. Either on SCE or the SCA side, there is no definition. It comes up all the time being, should we ha it's a crazy, we don't have a definition. for this bit. We're all trying so hard to differentiate ourselves from commodity coffee, the rest of the coffee scene, and we don't even have a definition of it, but I think it's, I think for the same reason you just outlined, it's, there's, there's reasons for that, and it's a healthy thing. Uh, questions? Anybody? Out of the gate? No? Oh, yeah, here we go. Thank you. Hello, Francis. Um, thank you very much for that. I'm so fascinated by what you're describing as the different lexicons for the customer which you're approaching. I think from the coffee industry, we've actually got into a bit of a rut in terms of how we approach the language we use. Um, the, we don't really distinguish the, the lexicon we'd use in a roastery versus how we would talk to our peers versus how we talk to our customer. And so you've actually kind of made me start thinking about the differences in, in those languages because I think that may actually be what restricts us often when we're talking to our customer. We're used to what we would, how we would describe a kiki kind of, I love that by the way, the, how we would describe a, a sharpness in an acidity is not actually approachable for a customer who is used to other coffees on the high street. There's not a lexicon, it's not a world that they're involved in. So that's actually really interesting. It's not really a question, it's just more of a statement. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating, and I was, Kim and I were talking, um, this is very broadly speaking, but if you, a lot of African coffees, because you think about, I, as I saw that, I started thinking about coffee names and names of different farms and how just because of where they're domiciled, a lot of countries, will tend, the languages will tend to have slightly more constant, heavy names. In a lot of African countries, you'll see a lot of like, what's that coffee, uh, uh, Reco, Reco, is that Reco? Everyone has a Reco coffee? Yeah, Reco, not Rico, it's Reco. Um, but it's, uh, there's a lot of African coffees that are very angular in their names and it conveniently corresponds with the kinds of very high acidity and maybe more jagged, to use your words, whereas a lot of the Latin American coffees will, again, very broad, broadly speaking, all of them uh, are going to be rounder and lots of vowels, lots of vowels. Though, yeah, but but the, but the coffees are often rounder and they're, they're more associated with being kind of uh, maybe more mellowness or sweetness approachability. Um, again, horribly broadly speaking. Um, I, I think the service things are fascinating because I think what you, there's this thing in coffee that keeps happening where things go full circle. I used to, I often make this joke that if someone like left coffee 10 years ago or even 15 years ago and went into a cave and came back out again right now, a lot of things would, would have gone full circle. Like 
fully automatic machines or semi-automatic machines are back in vogue, like drip brewers are now cool again, and it's all like, oh, nothing's changed? Cool, I'll go back inside <laughs> again. Whereas in that time, we've all gone on these crazy angles and come back. And I do think there's, there's a, a, a strong appetite right now to, to look back and look back at kind of how are these products being sold, consumed, marketed, educated on. Um, and the stores you show, the two different styles of serving cheese, um, um, have you seen anything in coffee that kind of matches, fits into any of those two categories neatly, or where it blurs them, or does anything interesting with that? I think that uh, where you get, and I'm, some, some, some roasters that I will keep anonymous, that I, uh, that I know, have had the problem of individual baristas who are super highly engaged, who are, who are doing independent uh, professional development, who are, who are really, really passionate about, about, about their, uh, their world and their career, individually branching off more towards that sort of French direction. And the struggle for how you relate that then to consumers who want the coffee that they want. And I think we, I mean, Customer service is tough, and you're always going to, burn, unless you're an exceptional person, you'll, you will burn out if you have to engage with a customer every day for too, too long. Uh, but I think that's something that really exacerbates it. It's, uh, we, we, we sometimes joke in the cheese world that the advantage of the, the, sort of the Anglo-Saxon model, this idea that you're, you're jointly tasting the cheese, is that it requires no differential of expertise on the part of the consumer and the and the cheesemonger that the cheesemonger ideally needs to be really good at looking after the cheese they need to be good at wrapping it they need to be good at tending it they need to be good at at all, all of those sorts of sort of sort of technical roles but they don't need to know a huge amount about it and it actually makes service much easier uh, because there 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 is never any sort of your, this sort of discussion of, are you the customer because you're going to pay me money, so are you a higher status, or are you respecting my expertise, so I'm a higher status. There is never any of that sort of, sort of, sort of jostling. It's, it's, it's very much a shared sort of thing. Uh, and I think that's what, certainly my experience with some coffee roasters, that's, or some, some coffee shops, that's what customers want. And then the barista who is, has, through their own independent study, become a tremendously knowledgeable individual wants to be, re wants to be respected uh, like a Laurent Dubois figure and wants uh, to, uh, to deliver the coffee that they know is best right. to the consumer. Well, it's interesting you say that because you know, we, if that older world of coffee and the big open bins of coffee beans and the sort of like the hoppers and you fill your bags, which was very immersive, but we kind of realized, oh, maybe it's not the freshest way to do this. And it's, we kind of wanted to differentiate ourselves as an industry and we moved towards beautiful packaging, beautiful packaging on a shelf, sell this as a lifestyle brand, heavy design focus. And then I think we could, you, could, you could observe the sort of rise of roaster retailers as an attempt to sort of combine those two things. Like, how can we make it immersive again? So you, because what cheese has just like, mm. it's so immersive. You walk in yeah. and just everything just hits you in the sights and everything, it's all just there. Whereas we tend to package it and, and hide it in some ways. That, that is cheese's great advantage. I, th I think yeah. that uh, it's inherently immersive and it's inherently easy to sample. Yeah. And uh, even, even when I compare it with the world of wine, it has taken until now to technologize in the world of wine the capacity to be able sustainably to give you a sample pour uh, in a way that with cheese you can just cut some off and, gi and give it to someone. The problem with cheese becomes uh, you need the volume of turnover. I have been to a lot, particularly of large multiple retailers who might be dabbling within the, with the world of a cheese counter. Uh, where essentially, again, cheese has gone to die. And it's, some, it's sometimes an interesting exercise because you see cheeses much, much older than you would ever otherwise see them. But uh, they're not, 
they're not getting, getting through. They would be much better having a, essentially a, a central cutting facility and having a grab and, grab and go in terms of the, uh, the quality of the cheese that you're getting. But they've made that decision to be, uh, to be immersive. And do you think people have... Lo I mean, I'm going to keep asking questions unless there is questions. OK, I'll, I'll defer to Kim. Thanks. Sorry, I was trying to uh, raise my hand in a subtle way, but I guess I had to resort to not being subtle. Um, thank you for that really interesting presentation. The last thing that you said, I, I wanted to ask a question about, um, because I love the idea and I agree that, like, yeah, diversity, you know, I don't want to just have one monolithic definition of how all coffee should taste. I love tasting different coffees from different places. Is there ever any tension in the cheese making world about, you know, the. While we may want diversity, what if Stilton producers got paid so much, you know, because the cheese buying world valued that flavor so much, and the Lancashire producers got paid so little because the cheese buying world did not prioritize, you know, is there ever any of that tension about like, well, you can tell me to keep making Lancashire, but like, why would I do that if I want to make money? I'm going to do what the people you know, in, in Abs France are doing. Absolutely. What I, what I would say is that principally becomes a tension between how long aged is the type of cheese you're going to make. Uh, in that your bank manager wants you to make something you can sell within 30 days. Uh, and that becomes a real... Uh, a real tension, and I think particularly the way that people who or who might be long-standing dairy farmers enter or re-enter cheese making tends to be driven these days by sort of a, a small business development loan and the sorts of market entry s studies that uh, a bank manager will demand. And the problem with those is for your actual sustain long-term sustainability it's easiest when you don't fight nature. I always think, I don't know if anyone is, I know there are some Americans in the, in the audience. The American game show Jeopardy, which, which if, if, you, if you don't know it, the, the, the conceit of Jeopardy, and this is a sort of 7,000 episode, it's a big, big US institution. And the conceit is all of the questions that they ask are answers. So you as the contestant aren't, preface all of your answers with, what is, and then the answer is already there. And for me, that's very much the, the, the idea of how terroir, how, how in, in terms of deciding these sort of what cheeses you're going to make works out, is that it's about what questions are you answering in deciding to make those cheeses. And if you're just answering economic questions, you tend to set yourself up for long-run problems because you're then not addressing them, particularly if you're trying, the more expressive you'll make. If you're going to pasteurize your milk, if you're going to operate at massive scale, feed, feeding industrial byproducts, then quite frankly, make whatever type, type you, your cheese is going to be dull, whatever, whatever you do, and it will never sort of transcend a commodity price. But if you want to make cheese sensitively, then your only sensible commercial decision is working with the hand that nature gave you. And you see how those cheeses which have had a long-term sort of evolution with the place that they're made, they are all answering very specific questions. So in the workshop this afternoon, I'll, I'll show you some of the consequences of, of uh, what happens when you try to make a cheese that goes against, that's a crime against nature, that goes against uh, the situations you have. And it's not pretty. And it, it causes you, you might not be getting the really high price or the really great turnover, but you're, all, you're, you're not getting the massive wastage. And I think that's where those sorts of things uh, become sensible. I think the biggest problem with cheese in terms of pricing is the cheese market is massively flat as a pyramid. So at the wholesale level, the price that you get as a as a top at the top 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 cheddar producer in the world is only three times the wholesale price of commodity block cheddar. And when you look at the extra risk you're bearing, the extra labour, the decision to make cheese is pretty much about ego more than anything else. And one of the things that I think the world needs is to stretch that pyramid. If you're going to have something that's genuinely sustainable, then the best cheeses will be 
massively more expensive. I'm, not massively, that sounds, sounds like I'm, I'm price gouging, but, but will be significantly more expensive. And they were in the 19th century. You really see how the availability of inorganic nitrogen fertilizers, quite frankly, has made protein cheap. So in the 19th century, the top cheddars, and they had very efficient methods for discerning who made the best cheddar, but the best cheddar would retail at a price in excess, once we correct for inflation, of 100 pounds a kilo retail, which is essentially about five times the price of these cheeses now. And, and people bought it, and people valued it, and people liked it. And I think returning to something like that is, 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 is where you would really get the sustainability, being able just to drag that pyramid a little bit more vertical. Any more questions? No, we've no more questions. I got a note there saying we don't have time for more questions. Luckily, though, there are workshops this afternoon when you all get to ask more questions. Uh. <laughs>